Yeah, so thanks very much. Um, I've been asked to talk about various things, but I'd like to talk about Maurice Halliday, particularly to who I call ultra, an ultra-conservative extraordinaire. Now, Professor Callum's dead now, um, but he was a very interesting man who crossed over all sorts of theoretical boundaries in his career as an academic, and I suppose a sort of radical conservative journalist for many years. Now, I knew him about 10 to 15 years before his death, and he taught at Peterhouse. Uh, there's a novel by Cindy Snow called The Masters about an election in a Cambridge college, Oxbridge College, on the intensity of the political passions at the microscopic level amongst these clever men. And uh, that's very much the mood, the sort of ambiance in which this man moved. He was regarded in some ways as a little bit of a fashion, but he never was. And I always had the impression with him as with Professor Roger Scruton, who he's different from, but who he resembles in certain respects, that they often wheeled out when people wish to uh, damage the uh, mainstream Conservative and Unionist Party. It was well said in the middle of the, the 1980s that Penguin, uh, a book from the top city friendlies of the Tory, published two books, Not a Free Friends Free to Choose, The Bible of Chicago School Libertarian Capitalism, and Roger Scruton's The Real Meaning of Conservatism. And they did both of those in some ways to attack the Conservative Party at that time. But no one can accuse you of attacking anything when you're publishing intellectual material that's in some way adjacent to the party concern. Now, Morris Cowling was a very rarity individual in all sorts of ways. I'll say a few biographical things about him first, because he's just an interesting man. The first thing is that Cowling lived at night. So Cowling used to sleep during the day and he used to live at night. And so when he had a university seminar with him, you'd go and see him at one in the morning. <laughs> so everybody was sort of wrecked, essentially, when they climbed up to this tower to see him. And the mist would be coming out of the can, and the porter would open his light, and we'd see him in bed with the porter after the murder, when he's got the chains on the door, and he's opening the door, and he'd come in there, and this leery old porter looks at you, and says, Professor Cowling, is it, sir? And you'd say, yes, and you'd go up this stairwell, and you'd open the door, and Callie would be in his book line group. It's very much the scenes with Jonathan Harper and Dracula, you know? You'd go into this room, and there's books on this wall, and books on this wall, and books on this wall, and Callie's lying on the bed. Callie's lying on the bed, dressed in green. And you go in there, and he looks at you, and he says, no, it's you, is it? And in, and in Cambridge, you have to read the essay out. So he taught political philosophy, Aristotle, Heraclitus, Plato, Aristotle, two, it says Marx, but it goes, in some way, to John Rawls, in a way. But it's that sort of spectrum. And he would give you these essays, it didn't really relate to the course as such, but you have to do such a large amount of work for it, but in a way, you were more than educated to sort of get the sort of degree. It wasn't particularly concerned with qualifications. Um, he, on Marx and Engels, he'd seen he'd just invented an essay country, he'd say, Marx, Apocalyptian Libertarian, disgust. And he'd have to go away and do that. Um, and of course, what he's talking about is the 1844 manuscripts, the early Marx, the differentiation from scientific socialism that comes later. The interesting thing about Cowling is that Cowling was the sort of archetype for the sort of dons depicted in Porter House Blue by Tom Sharp. Because of course that comedy, Porter House, he's Peter House, and he's talking about the ultra reactionaries in Cambridge. Now, Cowling was deeply un English in certain respects and deeply English in others. When I say un English, he was ultra intellectual, had no time for small talk, drip on garbage. No, 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 he lived apart from his family. <laughs> I think during the night, but at night, and was the same during the day. Now, if you made an intellectual proposition, or you wrote a sentence down in your essay, because you had to read it out loud in front of him as he lay there, he would attack everything you said, he would attack every proposition, and he would attack every idea behind it, because he believed in dialectics, he believed in struggle as the means to truth. And so you had this war with him, basically, between about 1.30 and quarter of 3 in the morning. Then you'd stagger down at the tower, you know, and another victim would come up to the entire and you'd see them slinking up the stairs, you know. It was well known that female students had to be kept away from him. Not for the usual reasons, but because he was regarded as so intellectually merciless. 
but it was sort of damaging. Certain students had to be kept away from it as well. So they only used to throw in into the gladiatorial pit at combat the ones who could take it. And this tells you a lot about Morris, and that Morris was a sort of, in some ways, slightly dangerous man, um, certainly for the sort of academic life of that era. I remember George Steiner, he was a narrative professor of European culture and civilization at Churchill and at Geneva University simultaneously, no, no, the same in Cambridge, once said at a private party that he regarded Morris Cowling as evil and a force for evil. And there are various reasons why he might think that, personal and otherwise. Now, Morris Cowling is unusual in that he was a deeply elitist and extremely conservative um, and a very intellectually fastidious individual. The interesting thing about him is that he set himself, in a more continental way, against liberalism as a conception. He didn't think of conservatism as a species of liberalism. He thought of conservatism as, in some respects, an anti-enlightenment proposition. His thesis, he didn't quite do a thesis or PhD in the usual way, but he basically thesis his text, a bit like Nietzsche's book of tragedy, um, was about John Stuart Mill and was published a general horror several years later because he sort of launches himself into an attack upon Mill. His argument about Mill is quite eccentric, even from the perspective of people who don't care for um, that particular thinker, because his view was that, contrary to the idea that Mill was opening up a world to tolerance and inclusion and freedom of thought and freedom of belief and secularity and sort of a plenitude of sort of milky goodness, he regarded him as an implicit totalitarian, a free, and a man who is determined to impose these values and views on others, and a militant destroyer of religion, and an aggressive secularist. One of Calvin's thesis is that he sees is that liberalism isn't a nice viewpoint, as everyone imagines, but it acts actually as a devouring viewpoint, particularly of prior religious ideas that uphold not those notions of hierarchy in society. So, his second book was on the use and misuse of limitations of political science. Though his early books were very abstract, and were one of the reasons he later resumed after a break of that again in Korea, he was broken by the war, the Second World War, and was broken by the period of journalism. But he can never really get started in journalism, but he always had a tendency to write an article of piece of about the he always had a tendency to write scandal reviews for people who own the journal. What was the attack the editor? What was the attack of the key print? And you can always imagine, because he was such a cross brain, and quite a reactionary and difficult individual, but very like all the war is a journalist who remember those examples. I remember the war once wrote an article in the Spectator in 1974, arguing for a good guitar in Britain. Make it incredibly popular. So, this is a who wants to be popular, you know. Um, and Cowling was a bit similar. So, he, he was sacked or removed, the expression was, from the express group because he, the, the editor said, You're too reactionary, you see, even for us, he said. And this was in the early 60s, which in many ways was quite prior to the cultural and social deluge which was to occur. Um, so he resumes his academic career with these texts in the background on Mill and on the uses of politics. And in a strange way, for such a theoretical man, the belief that theory doesn't impinge upon the life and manners and mores of politicians very much. Now a very complex individual, because although he believed that intellectual ideas dominate life, and intellectuals are the power class, even though they have no formal power in all societies, because everyone else just takes up and reuses this at another level of their ideas. He believed that politicians are usually motivated by anything other than principles. <laughs> and Carolyn is a strange individual because although he had to create brief beliefs of his own, he was also a bit of a nihilist. He was essentially an attacker. He had a mind that's often more associated with the left than the right. Because whenever you put a proposition to him, his first um, his first idea will be to attack to deconstruct, to break down, and to sweep away, and to see if your ideas can stand it. It's a sort of slightly more aggressive version of the Socratic method, whereby you don't put forward your own proposition, you just chisel away at whatever anyone has said some to you, and remain somehow to one side, you know? Uh, of course, he had no way to explicate it all 
uh, even better than he may have put it at the time later. So he had to do that for himself. So you've got these strange